I'm David Kessler. I think of myself as a death and grief specialist. Is it possible to work out certain feelings and emotions without understanding where it came from? Here's the challenge. Do we go to it with judgment or curiosity? I'm curious what else is there, and I'm going to remain open and curious for it to come up as it's supposed to. Let me be open. Let me be curious. What is that about going the other way where you experience such a deep pain and then maybe the bandwidth shrinks? Or is that just part of the process or some people just reactive to that? I always think about we only have two things to do, grieve fully and live fully. Some of us really got the grieving down. You got to do both. David, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's really an honor, especially someone in the grief space, which I never even contemplated being in. And you are, you know... You're you in many ways. And so it's an honor to sit across from you and to, I'm going to know I'm going to learn from you, which I already have. So I want to appreciate you for sitting across from me. Absolutely. And I'm sure I'm going to learn from you. And I'm glad that you get to be you today. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully not too jacked up on the caffeine we already talked about. For any of you guys that don't, haven't been paying attention to my Instagram stories, I bought an espresso machine, as I told David. Uh, but enough about the coffee. I'm already talking about it too much. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself for anyone that may or may not know you? And I'm assuming a lot of people listening do already know you, but please introduce yourself. Sure. I'm David Kessler, and I think of myself as a death and grief specialist. I think I've become more well-known around grief. Sometimes people are like, death. And I'm like, yes, I did that for years. I still do that every day. And I have a book on it, The Needs of the Dying was my first book. So I think of myself as being in that realm of death and grief. Uh, written six books so far. Um, grateful to have written two with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who I always see her voice going, tell them the stages aren't linear. You don't have to do them anyway. I always hear her saying, tell them. And, you know, a book with Louise Hay, and I've done, you know, a number on my own. The last one was Finding Meaning. I appreciate you doing a podcast. I did a 12-episode podcast. It challenged the heck out of me. The people were amazing. The tech was such a struggle. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm like, you have made it, my friend. You're, you're doing it. You have made it. I'm also not writing six books. So, you know, it's a little bit different. Well, right? that was over <laughs> years. I didn't crank them out last so, year. Nevertheless. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I know this world professionally. I also know it personally. And I think so many people who teach grief. There's nothing unique about that to me. We, you know, we, we, we went through dark nights and still go through them and want to help others. Mm. What is it about your personal experience of grief that was, that inspired you to take this avenue, this avenue of more quote unquote expertise and, you know, more of a clinical or professional sense where you're helping other people? Is there anything that ignited that outside of just your own experience? <sighs> you know, I think first of all, I had a mother who was in and out of hospitals. I like new hospitals. I was like a vending machine kid. I knew hospitals growing up. And then um, at one point, at the same time she was dying, we weren't allowed to go in the ICU and be with her. The hotel we were at across the street, there was a, a shooting. Ooh. And it turned out to be one of the first mass shootings in the U.S., I came away from that, and then she died. I came away from that whole experience feeling broken, damaged, not repairable, traumatized. And I really lived with that for a lot of time that like, well, this life got ruined. And it wasn't until I went to community college and heard about this woman, Kubler-Ross, that I'm like, oh, there's a language for this. Like, there's a language for what's wrong with me. And of course, eventually I learned there's nothing wrong with me. I've been through trauma and grief. Mm. So that hope that I found for me, I knew at such a young age with my mother dying, the only advice I got around grief was be strong, which is what most guys get, be strong, which translates into no feelings and take care of everyone else. And so that sense of, wow, we couldn't be with her when she died and be strong. Even at a young age, I thought, 
we don't do this death and grief thing very well. Mm. How old are you at the time? 13. Mm. Like, we don't do this really well. And that's, I think, why I wanted to do end-of-life hospice, palliative care, better than the experience I had. And those models do give us a better experience. And Lord knows there was better experience of grief out there. Yeah. And how, even though you, when you read, you know, Kubler Ross's book and you saw there was a language out there and you're realizing that you're not broken and all that, even though there is a language, what, what differences did you find in your own grief that maybe wasn't in the literature or that you couldn't relate to? Is there anything that stood out in regards to what you were feeling that you couldn't find words for? Or did all that information kind of give you some explanation into what you were feeling? You know, it's interesting. I was talking about that earlier today at another event I was doing actually with my writing agent, um, Margaret Riley King. And we were talking about when I first talked to someone about possibly writing a book, I came up with like a million things to write about and like they were all, Ugh. and the agent finally said, don't you do death and grief? Why aren't you writing about that? And I said, well, what's there new to say about death and grief in the world? And the agent said to me, we've never heard about it from you. Wow. So I think that's, you know, what do I have to add to the conversation? Just me, mm -hmm. just me. And you got just you. And we got you. I mean, there's, you know, I always say, if you've seen one person in grief, you've only seen one person in grief. We all do it so differently. Mm, that's so true. I feel like I, I said that recently. Cause I, you know what I get often, especially having this podcast and my friends that know me, they, if they bring up, I just lost someone or so-and-so just lost someone, like, they'd like, you know. And I always respond like, I mean, I, I know, but I don't know. Like, I don't know what you're feeling. I don't, I, there's so many, even if you lost your dad, I lost my dad. We both lost our dad at 12. It's like, I, I, I feel you in some capacity through my own lens and experiences, but I don't know what you're feeling. I don't, I don't, I don't know your, I don't know what you're feeling. I, I, I can hold that space for you and hopefully you trust me. And if you want to hear what I'll have to say, I'm happy to say it, but I've, it's, I have a hard time saying, oh, I, I know what you're going through. I know what you're feeling. So I don't. Yeah. And there's a lot of levels to that. Mm. There's one level about their kindness and their connection that they are saying, people don't get me in the world, but you've been through grief. So I know we're a member of this club. Mm -hmm. And it's so true with what you said. If I'm with someone else whose parent died or their child died, I'm also a bereaved parent, like, I don't know, you know, they had a different child die than me. They had a different parent. We can never really know each other's grief. Mm -hmm. And there's also where society comes up short. Like one of the things that used to get me so much is when after my younger son died, David, people would say, oh, can't imagine. And I felt like, you don't have to imagine. I'm right here. It happened to me. Got any questions? I'm open. You don't even you need to use your imagination. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're saying, your pain is beyond, I could not imagine. And sometimes they're suddenly making it about them. And I'm like, we don't need you to imagine your child dying. I just had it happen. Let's stay in reality here. So there's so many layers just to that comment, you know? So many layers. And again, I think it, the layers, again, I don't have time to even go through every layer, but I, I, I don't want to isolate people by saying, you know, I can't imagine. I, I refrain from saying that. Even though, depending who I'm saying it to, they know where I'm coming from when I'm saying that. But certain people, I don't want to say it because I feel like maybe they'll, it could take it the wrong way. But I, when I do say I don't know how you're feeling, it's just because of those layers. I mean, fa like difference in family relationships, timing, age, where you are, the stuff that comes after death. There's just so many layers to the onion of grief that even though there is a baseline of, I think, of foundational experiences, you could read in books that help this. But that's why I think what you're saying is so important to, there is, you heard one story of grief, you only heard one story of grief, however you worded it, much better than I did. And I think by sharing those experiences is so important because it, it lets you kind of, you know, you, you take everything with a grain of salt, but even though every experience is different, there are commonalities within each experience. So it's super different, but similar throughout that river, if that makes sense. No? You know, it also speaks to what a grief illiterate world it is. My website, I'm really lucky I got it early on, is grief.com. And I get to see the analytics. 
And I'll tell you, in the analytics, the most visited page is the best and worst things to say to people at grief. And we visited at midnight. Like, people don't know what to say. They're always, it's my most asked question. I have a friend who's at grief. What should I say? What's the, We want to get the words right. Mm. And it's a really hard shift for people to understand there's not right words. There's just you being with them. Mm. I, 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 I don't know the right words. I'm just here with you, man. I'm just here. I, don't, I can't know your walk, but just know I'm standing right next to you through your walk. That's so important because even you know, as many times if I spoke about death and contemplated about my own, I, I still tell people I'm not even sure what to do. So I'm more I'm, – me personally, like I think it also, again, more variables and layers to it. It's like depending on the person. You know, I don't even know what you want. So I think to me, again, what helps me is knowing someone's there and showing that. So I think it's just like that added pressure, you know, even if it's grief or anything else, just that you when someone's, you hear something like that happens, like an automatic switch, oh, I have to say something that's going to help them. And you add that, right. create that pressure and that pressure just gets you overthinking right. about the whole thing. So yeah, I don't know if there's a right approach, but I think just the fact that you can be there is, I mean, it should be enough. But then again, even the person that's going through it, maybe that's not enough. And maybe that person also expects you to say something profound. And when you don't or don't do this, like it's, it's a double-edged road. But I think at the end of the day, it comes down to communication on both sides. And it is so tough because you're so vulnerable when you're in grief. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I remind people in grief, like no one gets up in the morning and looks in the mirror and goes, all right, I'm really going to be mean to someone in grief. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just flimsy and trying to figure out the words and they were taught wrong and no one talked about it and they're actually doing the best they can too. Mm -hmm. Do you think the, the kind of to tag on to what you said about which is interesting how the analytics are showing people that are how to do, help be there for someone who may not be grieving and it just shows how to me how important it is or asking you how important is it for people to be educated on grief and dying that aren't going through it right now that, that haven't experienced it or not grieving at the moment or because i feel like with people that listen to my podcast you know i'm one of my goals is to latch on to people that haven't experienced it and learn from exper people that have experienced it without experiencing it yourself so how important is it for people to understand this process in retrospect to not overreacting when they see someone in grief that is all over the walls and maybe not themselves and not to judge them. Like I, you, I would like to think the the normal approach, like, oh, he just lost someone, so it makes sense. But I don't know if everyone has that radar. Well, you've really hit something there. Ideally, it'd be nice for all of us to pick up a death book and a grief book and listen to a podcast before we need to. Mm -hmm. It's filled with so much emotion when you're in it. Mm -hmm. It's nice to know it before and we don't. And I'll tell you, it's like when I teach people about children, it's so good. I'm like, don't wait to the horrible death to teach your child about loss. You know, when they'll say, oh, the goldfish died. We flushed it down the commode. We told the kids it swam out to the river. And I'm like, that was your teachable moment. Don't skip those moments. Oh, the neighbor died. We, we told the kids they went on a long trip. Forget the euphemism. Those are your moments to teach. That's so true. And again, it goes back to like this. It's such an avoidable conversation as you just expressed, especially with ch children. But it's the most dominating occurrence in life. It's the most common thing. And I say it all the time, but it's just so fascinating to me. I understand perhaps there's different angles of not knowing what it is and just general fear, of course. I understand that driving force. But it's just so fascinating to me. It's something that's so avoided yet so common. It's not even well, rare. Well, I make the joke like the statistics are in. The death rate's 100%. <laughs> like we're, we're going to have to deal with this. Mm -hmm. It's not even optional. We're going to have to deal with this. And, you know, in the last book, I never thought I'd be researching buffaloes. Hmm. But buffaloes, when they sense a storm coming, run into it. And they minimize the time they're in pain and discomfort. Humans, on the other hand, we run from grief and we have this mild, ris ri mild river of misery behind us, some people for their whole life, because they're just too afraid to address it. Isn't that ironic, too? Because it's going through the storm as the buffalo do. It's shortening the time period to get through the storm or however you want to expand on that. 
yet we think by avoiding it, we think we're doing ourselves a favor? Or do, I feel like innately we know we're not. Because clearly, if you're going the other way, going around the storm or running from the storm, however you want to do it, it's just it's causing you so much more pain, even if you don't see it or not. So there's just so much underlying pain that comes from that that I feel like becomes habitual, right? That may show up in other ways that you may not be able to define as your grief. But here's what's under all this, is the fear of our emotions. Hmm. On one hand, I hear all the time, David, if I start crying, I'll never stop. David, if I get angry, it's going to be dangerous. And it's like, you really can safely express your anger. And I've been with thousands of people who started crying, and they all eventually stopped. I mean, we cry again after that, but I've never really been with anyone that like, phew, never stopped. And I think, you know, I love groups. I run groups online. And what I love about that is we find ourselves in each other's stories. Yes. And I see you early on and you're, you're just like me. And then like, wait a minute, you went outside? Wait a minute. You, you were able to stop crying. Oh, if it's possible for you, it's possible for me. And that's the beauty of the discussion and hearing other stories. Right. And I think, again, I, I mean, how, I, my thought process, this discussion on death and loss, to me, I think the emotion, you'd know better than anyone, the process of going through loss and the traumatic events that follow and how you feel, I feel like those lessons and those modalities that you've personally figured out or learned how to get through are just so applicable across the board. And every, I feel like it's like that's the umbrella and then everything else falls underneath it where whatever you learn through that, you can apply to any avenue of life. No matter if it's grief, loss, a job. But then again, life, everything in life is loss. My, my, I don't know where I'm going with that. I just feel like it's just so right. – you can just replicate your lessons through grief to the rest of your life. And this doesn't just sort of permeate the general public. We're about to start our Grief Educator Certificate Program, and I'll tell you, therapists, first responders, counselors, they tell us no training on grief. How do you become a therapist without no mandatory training? Oh, there might have been an optional class, but even professionals don't get the training they need. So that's why it's so important no matter who you are in this, that we allow ourselves to get a little exposed to this important part of life. And I'll tell you one thing for anyone who's like, oh my gosh, really? Who wants to get depressed and hear grief? <laughs> I do more work online now. But pre-pandemic, four years ago, I was one of those people going from city to city to city. I was doing 30 cities, three countries. It was crazy. And I would go into one hotel after another. And there'd be, you know, 100 people, 200 people, 50, whatever that city could handle. And we'd be doing an all-day session on grief. In the next room, to the left would be the realtors. In the next room would be the accountants. Down the hall would be the Rotary Club. And it happened more than once. At the end of the day, everyone's gone. We're cleaning. We're putting away the equipment, my little projector, all that stuff for the slides. And the cleaning crew would go, hey, what were you teaching? And I go, why? Why do you ask? Oh, because your group was laughing the most. Huh. And I would go, grief. And they'd go, well, what kind of grief? And I would go, grief. Grief. Someone dies. And there's many types of grief. We could talk about that. But I'd say grief. And they'd be puzzled. And here's the thing I don't think we realize. When you go through those dark nights of grief, your bandwidth for pain is absolutely stretched. But so is your bandwidth for joy, mm. for laughter. The people in my audiences, they do laugh a little heartier. It is a deeper laugh. There is a deeper joy because there's been deeper sorrow. Can it go the other way? And I'm sure it can, but like, what is, what is that about going the other way where, you know, you experience such a deep pain and then you're, maybe the bandwidth shrinks 
Or is that just part of the process or some people just reactive to that? Well, there's a few things with that. One, I always think about we only have two things to do, grieve fully and live fully. Some of us really got the grieving down. It's like, oh, how do we integrate back into a little life? Can we, can we let a little life come in at some point? Others of us got the living down and not the grief. We're on ignore mode. We're putting it behind us. So we don't, it's really like you got to do both. Mm. The other thing you, you mentioned that I think happens is, I think of it like this, death, loss, throws us into chaos. Our work is to come back into balance. This is too much chaos. On this side is being stuck. Many times when we get to the chaos, we're like, this is too much. <sighs> Let me stay stuck. Stuck is safe. And we need to come out of both those areas eventually. But it's in our own time, in our own way. There's no forced prescription. There's no three easy steps or anything like that. And my grief's going to look different and be on a different timeline than yours. All that stuff. In regards to the timeline of people that you've, you know, you've confronted and worked with, what, what, is there, what do you notice from people that perhaps you're working with that have lost someone years ago and then are still working things out comparatively to early stages of grief. Is there a difference or is it making it more difficult for someone who maybe has pushed it off or still dealing with things they might not think it's part of your grief? Like how do you distinguish, say someone that lost a husband, brother, sister, whatever, 25 years ago? And uh, like maybe they don't even think of coming to see you because they think it, they don't even relate it. So how do you distinguish feelings or whatever you're feeling down the road whether it's grief or not. So a number of things about that. I, I have my own timelines. Everyone's got their own. I think about there's anticipatory grief that's before the death or before the breakup or before the divorce or before the anything. It's before the event. Then when the person dies, I think there's what we call acute grief. We're in it. We can't breathe. We can't think of nothing else. We're in free fall. And then at some point, and there's no hard, fast time to this, we move into early grief. Now, if I was to go down to my local mall, downtown, hey, what's early grief? What do you think early grief is? People would say, oh, early grief, is that the first week? Is that the first month? Is that the first six months? I think of early grief as the first two years. And then we eventually, on an average... And then we eventually move into mature grief. And people always say to me, how long will I grieve? How long will my wife grieve? How long will my partner? How long will my mom, my spouse, my child, whatever it is? And I always say, well, how long is the person going to be dead? Because if they're going to be dead for a long time, you're going to grieve for a long time. Doesn't mean you'll always grieve with pain. I still grieve my mother. It's all with love now. It's been decades. It's all love for her, but it's also still grief because to me, grief is ultimately love. I think of grief as love and grief as a change we didn't want. Hmm. Those are my two sort of big definitions. Now, the other piece is people think you go to grief counseling first week. We see a lot of people walking into grief counseling for the first time at five years. One of the people I had on my podcast is Will Reeve, Christopher Reeve's son. He talked about during the pandemic when he really had to sit alone and be alone and go into some isolation, how so much about his grief from his childhood, his father, mother dying, came up for him to work through and rework through, and how... Probably if you had asked him the day before the pandemic, he would have said it's, it's healed. And lo and behold, he realized there was more there. Now, one of the interesting things about our new world, and I see this on social media, healing is almost like a bad word. Like, don't tell me to heal. You, you know, I, no, this is my grief. How dare you mention healing? Don't ask me how the healing's going. And 
we all have our definition of healing. And I think when people have that reaction, it's a reaction because their grief isn't getting validated by the world. And if I'm going to talk about, oh, you're healing, I'm completely invalidating you. But my definition of healing is the event no longer controls us. Mm. And most of us walk around, whether it's Will Reeve or me or probably a lot of other people, we're making decisions about our romantic relationships from our abandonment, from our old grief, from our old trauma. We're deciding whether we stay at the job or whether we can deserve the promotion from our old grief, from our old trauma. We don't understand that like when it's unattended grief and trauma, it's affecting all your decisions. Mm -hmm. It's affecting your whole life. And that's what I wonder personally about me. There's so much good information there. So to make it about me, guys, this is my podcast, okay? Uh, sorry, so you my, did pre-warn me, and I did say, happy to go there, my friend. <laughs> yeah, happy did, to go there. I did preface, I'm looking for a free consultation, but, you know. It, Absolutely, you know, let's go. <laughs> I'm all yours. Let's go there. Because <laughs> I was, you know, just to refresh your memory and or tell you for the first time, I'm not sure how much you know about me, but my, so my dad passed on September 11th when I was 12 years old, and I can't help but think in relation to what you said, how it, you know, it, it tangles into all these decisions that we make. It was quite some time ago. I'm 34 right now. I'm going to be 35, so 23 years ago. And I always wonder, like, how much did my experience as a kid when I was 12 years old, how much does it affect who I am today? How much did it actually work? Because I feel good. Like, my his birthday just passed. I have that moment of reflection. Like, it's, it's like out of love, more love than ever and gratefulness, a little bit of sadness, but it's like happy sadness, as weird as that sounds. But I always just wonder how much, and is it even worth trying to figure out what, who I am today because of that and what my flaws, are they related? Are they not related? But there's a lot of, a lot of information I'm throwing at you right now. But with that, when I saw the towers go down for the first time, I saw on TV when I got home. And I remember like from that point on, after I cried, I feel like it all went black. And it was that defense mechanism, if you will, to just kind of like protect me in that moment. And you're going to figure this shit out later, which I had to. But what frustrates me is that blackness of, I feel like there's so much I don't remember. How important is that fog of lack of memory in some capacity of those those weeks, those, even though some of those years, I don't really remember how I felt in some capacity. I remember moments. But how important is it to uncover that that like memory trauma, if that's even the right term? Tell me his first name again. Is da he's still David as well. So we get three Davids in the room. Three Davids in yeah. the room, yeah. literally, yeah. figuratively. He's right there, yeah. <laughs> and... Where was he? He was in the 105th floor of the first tower that got struck and the second one that went down. So, you know, I remember getting home from school after it was already done, went to the TV. My, my mom or someone was trying to keep me away from it. Then after I saw the towers go down, I understood it was real and it was serious shit, cried. And then it's like, I don't, I don't know what happened after that. Like I obviously I remember moments here and there, I, I, but there, my mom was telling me when I had her on my podcast, which is a great episode, Mother to Son, she was talking about like we used to have these dinners, which I do remember having the dinners, but not as vividly as she was explaining it. She would have us have dinner together, which we usually did, but it was more, how's everyone doing? And she would, I, I had to ask her, I was like, what, what was I doing at the dinner table? She's like, you would just sit there and listen and you, know, you would cry sometimes, but you would just more listen than express. I was like, fuck, I don't even... I barely remember. I don't really, I can't even say, oh yeah, I was, was I there? Was that, that was actually me, the right, the right son? Because there's like so much shit that I don't remember. And part of me, just, I want to go through that. I want to like, I don't know, someone's going to hypnotize me or what, but it's like, I, I want to go back to bring those memories up that are blocked in some capacity. And my question to you is how important is it to unravel that, to even remember that? First of all, my heart sinks as I hear your story. No, oh, thank you for listening. I had a, uh... A dear friend of mine, Barry Perkins, was on one of the planes. I went to ground zero afterwards. Um, I'm there as an adult. You're experiencing it as a child. Ch ch our, our childhoods never quite happened the way we think they did in general in general, before we get to grief or death. Mm -hmm. On top of that, um, grief, trauma, there's a lot of protective mechanisms. You know, 
I don't see it quite as you you go blank or there's block. I mean, I think your psyche was trying to protect itself. It was more than you can process. You know, people will often say, hey, I think I was in denial for a while. I'm like, denial gets a bad rap. You know, you and I couldn't process all the pain of our parent dying in one day or one week. We would be on the floor and we'd never get up. Denial has a grace that it helps us process it in years and not in days. Mm -hmm. My processing of, and I'm much older than you, my processing of my mother isn't over. Every year I'm older, I see the world different, I see her different. You're going to do that too. You know, where are you in this? Part of it is just for you to notice. Like, even my body, I felt changes during your story. Did you? Does okay. your heart race? Do you get a little sadder? And just to notice some of that. Mm. And, you know, I think also it's important for us to know we all get in what I call performance situations. And, you know, someone listening going, oh, I don't have a podcast. I'm not on TV. I don't do that. No, you, you're in the grocery store and you're in performance situations. Mm. <laughs> you know, where all of a sudden we're sort of publicly revisiting our grief. And we may react differently than if we were privately. I mean, my guess is you're, you're willing to go a little more authentic here because you're willing to be mm. more authentic. And It's a lot about paying attention. It's a lot about paying attention. You know, is this fear? Is this grief? Am I reacting from this moment? What's my body feel like? I work a lot with Paul Denniston, who does grief yoga. You know, we carry grief in our body. You know, to just notice, wow, my body changed when you told that story. Mm. To pay attention to yours. You know, I sometimes when I work with people, I'll pause them and I'll go, David, hang on. We're in your story. Just want to pause you for a minute. How's your body feel? What's your heart doing? If someone says, oh, David, I'm so glad to be telling my story. My family doesn't let me. I'll go, great, continue. Sometimes someone will go, my heart's racing. And I'll go, let's take a break. Because I remind people, your heart doesn't race in grief. Your heart races in trauma. So we want to just be, oh, am I, re, am I going back and refeeling this? Am I re-traumatizing myself? We want to, like, we want to become our own grief experts. You need to become, and I think you probably already are, the best grief expert on you. Yeah, I just, want, I just correlate that with, I don't know if it's my curiosity or, like you said, maybe it's me paying attention to certain things to see how I feel it, to see if it's the dust is fully settled, if it ever will. But I think it's more just... I mean, like, what did I feel? Like, what was I, what did I truly did I feel that year, that week after? Like, again, I remember moments, but it's like, maybe it's not important for me to uncover that stuff. Maybe it won't even make a difference. Maybe it's just blocked out for a reason. And there's a, and there's a few things with that. Obviously, always good to look at trauma and see what's there. That's it. And something may come up because that was a, a traumatic death. And, there's a Buddhist saying about the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. It'd be great if we could really go back and uncover all your feelings from then. Maybe tough to do. How's your feelings today? It's the second place, best place to look. Mm. And to also trust there's an organic part of you, to your grief, to your trauma, to your wisdom, that if there's more that needs to come up, for you, David, to trust it will. I'm with you on that. And then, you know, I've, part of me has let go. And I wonder if this is a process for you, too, in regards to yourself and or, you know, people you work with. I'm like, is it, how important is it to really identify the source if I just understand how I feel and I understand where I feel it? 
and whatever emotion I define it as or whatever it feels like, maybe just understanding that's enough and I can just feel that, let that go through. Maybe it's not important to understand it came from this. Is it possible to work out certain feelings and emotions without understanding where it came from? Yeah, here's the challenge. Do we go to it with judgment or curiosity? And people will always say to me, oh, no, I'm not doing judgment. And I'm like, yeah, you are. <laughs> like when we look at ourselves and we go, oh, what's wrong with me? And why aren't I feeling it? I should be feeling more. And I've got to uncover it. And I'm not, I'm not being a good detective. And I'm not uncovering the source. And da -da. That's all judgment. Mm. Instead of kind of going, and like, I'm a judgment machine. So I'm not, I'm, there's no part of me that's telling you, oh, I've got this down. Yeah. But to go, what if I was curious instead? I'm curious what else is there. And I'm going to remain open and curious for it to come up as it's supposed to. Right. But it should be here now. Oh, that's a judgment. But I got to uncover it. Oh, that's a judgment. But I need to, nope, that's a judgment. Let me be open. Let me be curious. I think I'm generally naturally curious. I think that's why I have a podcast. I'm like genuinely right. don't want to know what other people have to say. But sometimes it's like, I, see it. I think we just all need to chill the fuck out. <laughs> it's very easier said than done. But so I don't know. Like the way I think about life right now and everything I do, whether I get anxious about growing this podcast, getting it to where I want to be, I'm like, I just throw my arms up, look up at the sky. I was like, okay, this is where I'm at. And it goes back to, I think, the beginning of the podcast of just kind of, you know, we're here. We're, and that's literally all we have. I feel like we can't, living in the past or the future, it's like, that's a maybe, that's a was, this is this is what we got. And it's much easier said than done. Much, I'm not saying, this isn't me judging. It's just an observation about how I live my life now. And I catch myself maybe going forward or going backwards and forgetting we're here. Because like this is the only thing. Like, whenever, we're, whenever we're scared, isn't it something that hasn't even happened yet? Unless you're in the shit. That, of course, that's a, that's a, that's a fear that your right. body can survive in the moment for X, for X right. amount of time. But it's just, I don't know. I think um, I think that's right. me with the bandwidth of humor, like laughing and all that. Like, I, oh, my God. It's like that's the best medicine for me. And it goes back to not taking it all too seriously, even if it is. And I think that's important to note. You know, there's a lot in there that, number one, I go back to that saying, um, a life unexamined is not worth living. I think that might have been Freud. A life, you know, not examined is not worth living. And a life over-examined is not a life lived. Mm, love that. And it's sort of being between those two, you know, and I see so many different places of that. I can't tell you, like even when I write, I'll get stuck. And my, my, my inclination is dive in, cancel stuff, really figure out what this stuckness. And sometimes when I go, nah, go to those movies, let this go, da, 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 see the friends. Like, I swear they say something that I'm like, that's it. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad we went to dinner. That movie, oh, that, who knew it was going to come from there? And it's the same way in grief too. We touch the pain. And then we need a distraction. Mm -hmm. We touch the pain. We need the distraction. I'm such an advocate of like, let's go into the grief. And we got to go into the life and into the distraction. And they're going to shed light. I mean, people who grieve well, live well. People who live well often grieve well. Mm -hmm. It's those two things sort of put together. Because you want to take in all of life. All of it. All of it. All of it, the good, the bad, the valleys, the peaks, all of it. And that's part of it. And so interesting. it goes back to just life and death in general. It's just, this is what, this is, whether you want it, whether you think you signed up for it or not, we're, we're, this is, we're in it. We're in it. And here's the thing, you know, anyone who's like, oh God, they're just early in it. Anything we talk about meaning and life and distractions and movies, they're going to be like, are you kidding? I can't get out of bed. And I always tell people, you know, we hear so much about peaks and resilience and tough and and I'm like, you know, resilience also looks like those days you can't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. That's being resilient too. So, but we're not talking about anyone like just in the midst of grief as we discuss all this. But there is something about our fears and death that we're so afraid of this subject. And here's the thing. People are like, what's it like to live in your world? It must be so depressing. And I'm like, no, I'm actually pretty happy in my world. I'm like, it's kind of a nice world. 
and I've had horrible tragedies. And I could cry now about my son. I mean, it will, that grief will always be right here. And I also realize when I really go into, oh my gosh, we said at the top of the show, everyone's going to die. I'm going to die. You're going to die. Every listener's going to die. This is depressing shit here. Or I can go, wow, I've learned from grief. I don't have forever. And no one here has forever. And it is true. You're going to go. I'm going to go someday. So I can either say, sorry, David, I got to go. I realize I could die today and this could be my last podcast and I got to go do 20 apologies. <laughs> or I could try to live in the moment and I could go, holy crap. So I could die today. You, could, I mean, I could be in a car wreck on the way home. This could be literally my last podcast. So when I take that in, I actually don't get depressed. I go, wait a minute. Wow, if today could be my last day, this could be my last podcast, and David could be my last discussion, let me go deeper here. Mm. Let me make this moment count. Let me not throw this away. Oh, I'm doing another podcast. Let me really take this in. Let me make this so meaningful for me, for you, for the people watching and listening. And then hopefully I don't die today and I get another day of life that I try to make tomorrow yeah. meaningful. So, so, I mean, ultimately what I'm getting at from that is that, that how important for your personal grief and for, you know, what you're preaching is that conversation, that perspective, fear and flip conversation. Is that a majority of the work? Except I think it's not as easy as fear and flip. It took me a lot, a lot of time to get there. Yeah, and that's why I don't like, right. I, I understand it, but I, I feel like it comes off the wrong way. But like you said, that people that right. are in the shit, it's like, Go through, you got to go yeah, through. Yeah, this yeah, is, this is yeah. Not a, this, this is yeah, there's stage. no skipping the dark nights of the soul. Yeah. And I also want people to know, and like this is why I love to, group work and getting together and all that and podcasts and all, is that, you know, I'm planting a seed here. I'm planting a seed. And I'll tell you the one thing is my biggest audience for years was therapists, was training therapists before my son died, training therapists for grief work these therapists would show up and they would tell me, number one, they didn't get grief experience. And then they had a tragedy. Their children died. They were, you know, had people die in horrible tragedies. And they were here learning from me to how to help others. And I was so impressed that they continued to live. Mm. And when my younger son died, one of the things I got is that they were evidence that life after loss is possible. And that's what I try to be now, that life after loss is possible. That's what you are. Your evidence that life after loss is possible. And there's someone out there who's probably hopeless in their grief that might hear us and go, oh, well, oh gosh, 9-11, oh, child dying, father, oh, Gosh, if they're getting through it, maybe there's hope for me. And I want to say to them, if you're not feeling it yet, it's okay. I have hope for you. I'll hold hope until that person in the dark night can find it for themselves. So tragic that our loved ones died. Permanent. Physically permanent. They're not coming back. And your loss of hope is temporary. Hmm. Amen. That's that's beautiful. I feel like I can have like 12 more podcasts with you. So I appreciate you dropping all that knowledge on us. You know, I, I want to end it with one thing. Normally I would go the route of what advice do you have for people for grief, but I'm going to, I'm going to link all his books. You can read his books on that question. Uh, but I do want to ask, what would you say to people? What should we already refer to that avoid the conversation of grief and loss that haven't lost someone? Why do you find the conversation of death and life is important for everyone, whether you've lost someone or not? Because it's going to be part of life. And I think we're in the midst of life. I mean, look, if, if, you, if you're, you love skiing, you love racing, you love a great TV show, I mean, whatever you love and you do, it's not all peaks. 
there's storms, there's valleys, there's dark nights. And if you're not walking through them, thank goodness. I'm glad you haven't been hit with that yet, and you will. But in the meantime, people around you are going to show up who they're getting hit. Their parents are dying. Horrible things are happening. Don't leave them alone. Mm. Walk with them a little. It's beautiful. And it just reminds me again to cap it off with what you said earlier about the buffalo and the storm and really and also with the people that everyone that's cried, they eventually stop crying. It's like this the storm eventually ends as well. There's gonna be another storm, but the storm right. and the tears and the rain, they do stop. And I think every time you go in there, you come in with a little better a little better raincoat each time. Whatever the hell that means. I didn't think of better analogies. Uh, David. That's oh. pretty good. You come in there with a better raincoat. That's pretty good. <laughs> Thank That's you. That's actually pretty good. Yeah, we'll use that. Now I had to get a sponsor from like a... Raincoat company. From North Face or some shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, David, I want to thank you for, for sitting down with me. And um, we're I'm definitely we're going to end this episode. I'm going to have to tune in for... I'm going to plug your books. I want, to, I want you to plug yourself in regards to the book you just gave me and all your other books and what you got coming up. Uh, I'm, this episode for anyone listening might be in the past or the future, but um, probably like a week or two. So be cognizant of any dates coming up, but plug whatever you got to do. Sure. So I have a lot of things. I have a, a online group called Tender Hearts and we run over 25 groups each week for like death of a spouse, death of a child, death of a sibling, death by suicide, fentanyl, faith, afterlife, anything you want to talk about, we probably got a group. It's a low monthly fee. And you can stay for a month, stay for six months, and no one gets turned away for lack of funds. Mm. So there's help out there. That's for if you're in grief. And there's people who like, they're talking every week. And there's people who are in the background of Zoom and never going to show their face. You get to do it your way. I also have a grief educator certificate program. It's once or twice a year. We're about to do one that's coming up. And, uh, they can find that at grief-educator.com. Tender Hearts is at Tender Hearts, plural hearts, and then the word support, tenderheartsupport.com. All of this is on grief.com too. And um, I, I love for people to check out grief.com and look under resources, tons of resources there. Mm. Anyone who wants more from me in terms of a podcast, um, they can go to Spotify and look for Healing with David Kessler. I did 12 episodes there. And uh, I think that's a glimpse of my world. And, and the book, Finding Meaning, my last book. Here's the cool thing about it. Well, here's the uncool thing about it. Like, I know I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Finding Meaning, like, not the greatest title. People are like, I'm not ready for it. I'm in grief. Mm. The book's really about excavating the grief. When you excavate the grief, the meanings there. And I'm not saying, oh, there's meaning in your loved one's death. No, there's no meaning in your dad's death or my son's or my mother's. Meaning is in us. It's what we do after. Mm. And it's also people are like, I don't know where to begin. I just like it just came out for pre-order. Finding meaning is actually going to have a workbook. So okay. if you look on Amazon for finding meaning workbook by me, David Kessler, It'd be great to get that pre-ordered. That's my world. It's an amazing world. I'm just glad to be uh, putting my hand in and reach in there a little bit. And all the links he just said, for anyone listening, as usual, I'm going to put that in the show notes so you can find all the links he's talking about for just easy, clickable access to scroll down. Uh, David, I want to thank you again. And I want to stay you for three more minutes on the mic. I'm going to ask you a couple of bonus questions for my audience. We'll get you out of here in five minutes. Um, David Kester, check out his new book, all his resources, education, whatever the heck you want. Just go to grief.com and the links below. Seriously. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You're amazing. And thank you for your meaning making you're doing. I appreciate that. Maybe I have some more excavation to do, but that's a... Uh, Don't we all? Yeah. Don't we all do? Don't we all? We all got that dirt. All right, y'all. Another episode of Dead Talks, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video, more episodes, and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and all that. And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.